Welcome back fellow aircraft builders and aviation enthusiasts. Thanks for joining me for another video segment on my Stoll CH 750 uh, tips and tricks series. Um, this is going to be a little different video format. I've never been on this side of the camera before. So I'm kind of uh, apprehensive about this, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to see who I am, who's narrating these videos that you've been following, and uh, give you some insight as to what my thought processes are uh, when it comes to building this aircraft. Um, this is part one of probably two or three parts. I have filmed a few versions of this and I keep <laughs> ending up at about the 50 minute mark. Uh, so I'm going to try to break this up into digestible segments, if you will. And uh, the video series, is, uh, this particular series, is going to be essentially 10 uh, scratch building or plans building concepts and recommendations um, that I have. And they're not in any particular order. I am attempting to follow a bit of an outline slash script here so that I stay on track. So again, very different format than what you're probably used to. Uh, this is a good place to start. If you haven't started your project yet, this video is a good place for you to start for um, information gathering purposes. Um, as with m most of my videos, or all my videos rather, uh, the focus is on people that are building on a budget and if you're scratch building an airplane you're generally building on a budget. Most people don't scratch build if they have the money to run out and buy a kit or buy a fully built, you know, built already built airplane. So um, it's going to be some of the trials and tribulations that I've gone through building this airplane from scratch uh, and attempting to save money and making mistakes along the way and not saving as much money. So um, before I get into the 10 uh, recommendations, uh, I want to give you a little insight as to who I am, why I'm building an airplane. Now, I'm not a professional aircraft builder. This is the first aircraft I've attempted to build. It's not complete yet, so take my uh, advice with a grain of salt. Um, you know, I'm making mistakes, you know, as I go along building this airplane and trying to figure out problems and, you know, figure out solutions to problems as I film these segments and as I go through these, um, you know, videos with you guys. So, you know, you have to evaluate your own, you know, work. If you're building your own airplane, you have to evaluate the parts that you make. You have to evaluate the assemblies that you put together. You need to determine whether or not they passed um, they pass uh, acceptable, you know, standards for aircraft construction. You know, I'll give you some resources to, you know, help you determine those things, but, you know, don't take my word for anything. Uh, you know, the advice is only worth what you pay for it generally, so um, if I can help you and if these videos help, great, but uh, don't rely on me solely for whether or not your part or your aircraft are safe or made appropriately. You have a lot of responsibility in the aircraft that you build uh, yourself. Understand that building an experimental aircraft or a home-built aircraft, there are inherent risks uh, in that uh, finished product uh, that are not there for general aviation aircraft. Certified airplanes have a whole different set of standards that they have to go through in order to be able to be certified for flight duty. And, uh, you know, they have to have uh, structural testing, they have to have load testing, and things like that. Experimental aircraft don't have the same process. so. Uh, experimental aircraft, while it can be very safe, um, and you can certainly build an aircraft that's very safe, uh, there are, statistically speaking, a higher number of risks associated with home-built or experimental aircraft than there are with factory-built aircraft. So uh, just keep that in mind and understand I'm no expert. Um, so further along on that ask on that those lines I do have some uh, college level uh, engineering instruction I originally was going to go to college to be a mechanical engineer I changed my mind after a couple of years and decided to go into law enforcement so my government my, my background is primarily now in government uh, I'm no longer in law enforcement but I do still work for the government uh, but my degree is in criminal justice so my you know Professional education is geared towards government service and you know that sort of thing. Um, I do, however, uh, I, all my schooling in high school and at least a couple years of college was geared towards engineering. So I do know how to read things like blueprints. I'm very familiar with um, you know drafting, computer aided design, terminology, techniques, symbols, things like that. So I do have a little bit of background in there. The only airplanes I've ever built were model airplanes, and most of those were the plastic variety you find in the toy store, and you only need a little bit of cement to put them together. I've built one balsa scale model. Uh, it was a Gillows P-51 Mustang. Um, I built one of those. 
So that's my experience building aircraft. However, I do have a lot of experience building other things, doing home improvement, repairing stuff, that kind of stuff, because I like to work with my hands. I like to have a project going all the time. Consequently, I've chosen to build an airplane. This is going to be the project that dominates my spare time for the next several years. Um, I am a licensed pilot. I got my license back in 2006, and I've flown off and on uh, since then. Uh, currently not flying because I can't afford to fly and build. Um, but prior to my pilot's license in 2006, I flew alternate ultralights a little bit um, between 96 and 2006. So I have a little bit of uh, flight experience to, you know, kind of base my building decisions on and things like that. I'm an EAA member and I try to go to Oshkosh at least once every few years. So uh, enough about me. Um, why am I making these videos? Well, there's two reasons. Uh, one is I when I started looking at all the available resources, in fact, I started this project before YouTube even existed, but uh, when I started looking for resources on, you know, how to build an airplane, how to convert an engine, uh, you know, what kind of airplane I wanted to build, I found that a lot of the instructional videos I saw or, you know, instructional materials that I could, found were, or could find were lacking in detail. And I tend to be very detail-oriented. I like specifics. I like I like step-by-step -step specific things. And a lot of stuff that I found tend to just gloss over, um, you know, the topics and, and just weren't as much detail as I wanted. So part of my uh, goal in making these videos is I'm kind of making them for who I was before I started building. I'm kind of making them for somebody that's in my situation that's looking for very detailed videos, looking for specific ways on how to solve specific problems and, you know, the real nitty gritty of things, which is why I tend to be long winded in some of my videos why this is now going to be a multi-part video rather than one short video. Uh, and, you know, anybody that knows me in, in real life knows me personally knows that I tend to explain things to death. So I try to keep things in perspective, but I do get long-winded, so I hope you brought a lunch. Um, the other reason I'm making these videos is that uh, it forces me to stick to the building process. If you guys ask me questions or you want to see how to build something, or see how I did something, it forces me to be out in the shop, it forces me to be out here building and working on my project and being able to create things that um, you know are useful to other people. So it's, it's, it's a good way for me to stick to it and video and photo document what I'm doing because ultimately I need to showcase that to the FAA to prove to them that I built this aircraft. Uh, so it gives me a lot of you know ways to make that happen. And I, I enjoy it. I enjoy filming the, my progress. I enjoy uh, receiving feedback and comments and, you know, questions and things like that. So it's just part of the enjoyable process for me. I am going to put some links to some documents and uh, some resources in the comments below. Uh, one of the things I'm most likely going to share is my spreadsheet for my build log that I created. Um, and I, I haven't decided whether or not I'm going to share the one that I'm actually using and just, you know, keep it read only for you guys or if I'm going to just make a copy of it and then and then share that copy. Um, but I'm also going to give you a list of what I think are recommended tools, minimum, you know, minimum tools that you need to build this aircraft, recommended tools, uh, things that I recommend you do, and uh, some other resources there, as well as some external resources like the Experimental Aircraft Association and the FAA's Advisory Circular 4313, which I'll talk about later. So uh, hopefully you'll find this uh, video, although the format is a little different, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to give you guys some good ideas on what scratch building or plans building an aircraft is like and, uh, you know, some of the things that I've found as I built this airplane or as I've been working on this airplane because it's certainly far from done. So, number one, uh, scratch build an airplane only if you enjoy building something um, if, or if you think you'll enjoy building an airplane. Um, a lot of people make the mistake of trying to build a kit aircraft or even scratch building an aircraft because they think it's the cheapest way to get in the sky. Um, not only is it usually not the cheapest way to get in the sky, but if you approach it with that mindset, you'll probably never finish your project. Statistically speaking, very few people, people actually finish an airplane project, whether it's a kit or scratch build. Very, very few people actually finish a scratch build airplane. Um, and that's especially true if the only reason they're building an airplane is so they have something to fly. You're far better served taking out a loan or, or just saving up your money to buy an aircraft, a general certified aircraft that's already flying and is ready to go. Um, 
a used certified airplane, especially some of the older models, are going to be um, you know far cheaper than than building a brand new airplane. So <clears throat> there are some exceptions to that. I mean, you can read stories in sport aviation as somebody that built an experimental plane for six thousand dollars, but they already had they had an engine given to them, or they already had an engine to start with, so they're not counting that expense. You know, they're they're using a wrecked airplane for instruments and, or even some of the parts or materials so they don't have to buy a lot of materials um, you know those make for great reading in sport aviation but th they're really you know far out of the norm for building an airplane whether it's scratch built or kit built so understand that you know that six thousand dollar you know barn built airplane that they they showcase in sport aviation is general just most of us are not going to be able to make that happen without the exact set of you know right, right circumstances at the right timing and all that other stuff if you have to buy an engine you know a, a working running engine and you have to buy instruments and you have to buy materials to build your plane you're probably going to spend a lot more than you would if you just went out and bought something that was certified used so for cost comparison um Let's say you wanted to go out and buy Piper Pacer or a Cessna 150 or even a Cessna 152 maybe, so a 50-year-old plane or a 40-year-old plane. Some of those out there that are in flying condition can be had for, you know, easily under 30 grand, but some of them, like the 150s and the Piper Pacers, I've seen flying examples of these planes going for less than 20000 Now, that doesn't buy you a lot of plane for that price, but these are flying planes that you can go out, buy them, insure them, and go flying with, with no maintenance they're they're current you know they have a current annual inspection on them right now and you can go fly them and so if you've got fifteen thousand dollars to drop on an airplane or you're willing to take a loan out uh, that can get you in the air for much more cheaply than scratch building a plane can so <clears throat> um, you know to compare it to my stole ch 750 project I'm going to have between twelve and fifteen thousand dollars wrapped up into the firewall forward, so that's going to include all of the stuff that I need to connect the engine to the airplane, instrumentation that I need to connect to, all the little sensors and all that stuff, including the engine, the propeller, the spinner, the nose bolt, the cowling, all that stuff. Twelve to fifteen thousand dollars. On top of that, I will have to have built the airplane. That's going to cost me somewhere in the neighborhood of five to six thousand dollars worth of material. I'm going to have somewhere between four and six thousand dollars in tooling costs. And then I still have to put a panel and upholstery in the thing. So, you know, depending on how I build my panel, and I haven't decided that yet, more on that later, uh, I haven't decided on all the specifics of my panel, but I could have anywhere from 5000 to, you know, $12,000 into the panel. So if we split the difference on all these things, I'm probably going to have about thirty-five dollars to $40,000 wrapped up into a scratch-built airplane, which is supposedly the cheapest way to go flying. It very clearly is not the cheapest way to go flying. So I'll have a brand new airplane when I'm done with it, but it's not the cheapest way to get in the air. I'm okay with that because I want to build an airplane. So the main economy of scratch building, where the cheapness of scratch building comes into play, is if you can scrounge or get donated materials or things like that, but it also allows you, even if you're buying all brand new materials like I am, it allows you to spend a few hundred dollars here and there and continually make progress on your plane. A sheet of aluminum might cost $100 or $200 depending on the thickness. You can buy a sheet of aluminum, cut it into the parts, form the parts, and keep working for that ex that couple hundred dollars a month or so. Um, but you know, overall, it's not going to save you any money, and you won't be flying very quickly. So keep that in mind. Only scratch built. If the if the end re if if your end game is you want to build an aircraft with your own hands, that's why you should scratch build. That's why you should kit build. You want to build an airplane, and and that's what your your goal is. If your goal is strictly to fly and you care less about building, don't even bother because you won't even get you won't get anywhere with that mindset. Uh, number two, you need to thoroughly evaluate what your production capabilities are. So before you get started in an airplane build, what's your capacity for fabrication? How, what kind of tools do you already have? Do you already know how to weld and have a welder? Do you already have you know machining tools? Do you already have um, sheet metal bending tools? Do you have riveting tools? Do you have you know, metal cutting tools? Do you have woodworking tools? Because you have to build a lot of form blocks to build an aluminum airplane. So what, what kinds of tools do you have? And furthermore, what kinds of skills are you going to learn or do you want to learn? Do you, do you not know how to weld but want to learn how to weld? Do you, um, do you already know how to use a drill press or how to use a drill or how to use a rivet gun? Or, you know, do you have an air compressor and know how to use a pneumatic riveter? 
or a pneumatic drill. I mean, some of these things are very basic, but if you've never done it before, it can be a daunting task to learn all these things. So what do you want to learn and what do you already know how to do as it relates to your project? Different projects require different levels of skill, different level, uh, different types of skills. You know, for if you're building a composite, you know, airplane, you really don't need a lot of metal fabrication skills. But if you're building a, you know, an all all metal airplane, well, you need a lot of metal fabrication skills. You need to know how metal forms and things like that. These are all things that you can learn, and these are all things that you can develop a skill for. But you've got to understand what you're getting yourself into. So, <clears throat> you know, again, we talked about tools. What do you need to buy? Do you need to buy a welder? Do you need to buy a metal bending break or build a metal bending break? For an all-metal airplane, you absolutely have to have a metal bending break of some kind. I needed one that was uh, at least capable of bending eight and a half feet long sections of 40 thousandths material. I didn't build one big enough in the beginning, so I had to borrow one from a friend. So these are things that you need to consider. Uh, and the, the plans, when you, when you buy a set of blueprints, these, that's where you're going to find that information. You're going to find what the longest piece of material is to bend, how thick that material is. You're going to have to network with other builders to find out what works and what doesn't. And hopefully these videos that I'm doing will help you in that, in that process. But um, how much space do you have? That's another huge consideration. You know, what is your, what is, uh, what, you know, what space do you have to work for? Most of your kit manufacturers will tell you that you can build their airplane from kit form in a one stall garage. So that's basically a 12 by 24 or maybe even a 10 by 22 space. If you have that much space to work for or work with, um, you can build a kit airplane. But I can tell you if you're scratch building, that's not enough space. You need at least double that to scratch build. And if you ever hope to park in that space at the same time, you need a lot more. So all your fabrication tools and your workstations and your welder and your welding table and your bending brake and your assembly table and your, your vice table and places for your sanders and your drill press and all that, that takes space. You cannot do that in a single stall garage and assemble the airplane at the same time. So, you know, um, I would recommend for any scratch built project on a small two seat aircraft like the Zenith Stoll CH750, scratch building is going to require a minimum of a two stall two stall garage worth of space you may be able to get you know park in there in there when you're not working on it but generally speaking you're going to need that full two stalls to, to really do it the other consideration is, is if you live in a cold climate i live in mid michigan it gets pretty cold here in the winter not like canada or you know north dakota or minnesota but it gets cold enough that it's very uncomfortable out here in the winter it can get as cold as you know 25 degrees in my garage if i don't heat it uh, you really need a heated workspace so you can work on this project year-round. If you can't work on the project year-round when you're scratch building, it's going to add years and years to the project. If you hope to finish it in any reasonable amount of time, you want to make sure you can work on it year-round. All right, so that's the end of part one. When we come back, we're going to start with uh, number three of our concepts and recommendations. Thanks for watching. Good luck with your projects, and stay tuned for part two.